that we are all descendants of other Italian adventurers, the immigrants who ultimately settled this great land. We're all pretty much told one story in school and that um, it's not necessarily what's true. hundred years ago, Columbus was the great hero because he was the one who essentially opened the new world to the colonization by Europeans. By the end of the 20th century, we were less sure that that was such a good thing. If William the Conqueror had come ashore in England in 1066 and said, look at me, I'm discovering England, the Saxons would have said, that, that's ridiculous, you're invading the place, which is what Columbus uh, did in the West Indies. For better or worse, Columbus's voyage had epic consequences. His so-called discovery of the New World ushered in an era of opportunity for Europeans and one of defeat and near extinction for the people he called Indians. After Columbus, the world would never be the same. For centuries, Western Europeans had dreaded the dangers of the Atlantic Ocean. They called it the Green Sea of Darkness. But by the mid-1400s, new advances in navigation allowed the intrepid Portuguese to sail partway down the western coast of Africa and as far west as the Cape Verde Islands. While the Portuguese tried to discover a route eastward to the Indies, a young man from Genoa was convinced that the East Indies could be reached by sailing west. Aristotle says that between the end of Spain and the beginning of India is a small sea, navigable in a few days. Almost everyone else thought Christopher Columbus was wrong. But after six years of indecision, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain finally consented to Columbus's enterprise of the Indies. And on August 3rd, 1492, he set out with three ships on a journey he expected to last no more than a few weeks. More than two months later, his ships were still at sea. His crew, frightened of the unknown and worried that they would not be able to return, threatened to mutiny if he did not turn back. On the following day, October 11th, from the deck of the Santa Maria, Columbus sighted land. From the moment Columbus and his men set foot on the island he christened San Salvador, they began an irreversible process of biological, cultural, and material exchange that continues to this day. The Columbian exchange is, a, is a, uh, uh, an idea that what happened when Columbus arrived in the New World was it began a whole system of exchanges between the Old World and the New World, not only in human terms, but in biological terms. Before 1492, life forms in the world had been developing divergently uh, because of geographical isolation in the Old World and the New World. And then Columbus uh, connected the two, and ever since then we've been connecting them tighter and tighter and tighter, and there's just an avalanche of life forms back and forth. In some ways, the short-term effects were disastrous. The introduction of European diseases, for example, decimated American Indian uh, populations. It was really a holocaust, uh, which in many places, whole peoples dying out. And in uh, large sections of the Americas, up to 90% of the population uh, decimated by diseases. after the initial disease crash. The uh, food crops that the Europeans uh, and Africans uh, brought with them fueled a population uh, growth uh, in the Americas that's still going on. What happened in the old world is even more spectacular and probably more important um, because you cannot imagine how all those 
people could be living in Asia, in Eurasia, in Africa without American Indian crops. Maize is the most important single crop for Highland Indonesia. Potatoes have been the staple very nearly every meal in Scandinavia, uh, right across Northern Europe, uh, Russia. We're still living today with the results of the uh, Columbian Exchange. And many people have said that, in fact, 1492 and the so-called discovery of America was perhaps the most important event in the history of the world uh, as a real sort of marker in the history of the world uh, and that the history of the world really should be developed to be to before 1492 and after 1492 for the reason of the Columbian Exchange. Columbus's voyage permanently linked the four continents of Europe, Africa, South America, and North America for the first time. But Columbus would go to his grave believing that what he had found was not a new continent, but simply the outlying islands of the Far East. In 1492, mapmakers still depicted the world much as Ptolemy had some 14 centuries earlier. North and South America were not represented at all on maps of this period. But Columbus's voyage set off a frenzy of exploration that led in rapid succession to the European discoveries of South America, Central America, Florida, the southern and eastern coastlines of North America, and Mexico. In 1507, a German cartographer named Martin Walsemuller first showed the new lands as a fourth continent, completely separate from Europe, Asia, and Africa. Walsemuller had no proof of this, he based his map on scientific theories about the size and shape of the globe. In 1513, 20 years after Columbus sailed into the Caribbean, Vasco Nunez de Balboa crossed the Isthmus of Panama and found the Pacific Ocean on the other side. Europeans finally had proof that what they had discovered was more than just a western route to Asia. It was a world unto itself. My desire was to pass by no single island without taking possession of it. In 1493, the Pope divided the New World, giving everything east of the demarcation line to Portugal and everything west of that line to Spain. The old expression is that the Spanish were motivated by glory, God, and gold. Um, and in some ways, that, that's accurate. God, because the expansion and the Spanish crown justified the expansion by the concessions given to it to carry the word of, uh, of the church to heathen lands. Gold, because they saw no uh, contradiction in, uh, in gaining wealth for Spain, for the king. And glory, because these are people of the Renaissance who have a concept of, of themselves and what they're doing that they, through their own efforts, are able to make their name, make their reputation, serve their king, and serve God all at the same time. The explorers, or conquistadors, were told to read to the Indians a document that explained that they represented the king, and the king represented the pope, and the king and the pope had told the Indians essentially to submit, or if they resisted, they would be smashed. So I think this is um, more than simply a, a justification. It's a, it's a deep sense of righteousness that the Spaniards brought with them. In search of new lands to conquer, Hernan Cortez led an expedition that landed on the eastern shores of Mexico in 1519. Following rumors of a rich civilization, Cortez headed inland toward Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. The people who lived in central Mexico are the people that we have come to call Aztecs. They would have called themselves Mexica. Central Mexico had been an area of uh, developed civilization for thousands of years before the Mexica came on the scene. Great civilizations had risen and fallen. So the Aztec empire, as it came to be called, uh, 
really dates in the last 50 or 70 years prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Tenochtitlan, which is where the present core of Mexico City is located, uh, was really a, a wondrous place. The city held perhaps somewhere between 150,000 and 300,000 people, which would have made it on a scale as large as any of the great European cities. But it was, in fact, a great city. It had a great marketplace. Uh, it was a political center. And it was uh, also a center for of industry. Word of Cortez's approach quickly reached Montezuma, the ruler of the Aztecs. When the Spaniards marched into Tenochtitlan, it was a unique moment in world history. Here were two incredible civilizations that had developed independent of each other, had no knowledge of each other, and then are brought into contact. Each side had to draw on itself to explain the other side. Where did these people come from? How could we explain them? How did they fit into our vision of the world? Relations between the Aztecs and the Spaniards were peaceful at first. But the Spaniards soon angered the Indians. After barely escaping Tenochtitlan alive, Cortez and his followers returned the following year with an army of Indians from neighboring areas. The Aztecs, partly for religious reasons and partly because of the resistance of their opponents, left a few areas unconquered in the area under their general control. What happened when the Europeans arrived is that these unconquered areas provided natural allies to the Europeans against the Mexica. The military conquest was complete. Uh, the Spanish, in the last days of the fighting, for the capital, Tenochtitlan, essentially went building by building, and the city was destroyed. Those whose assignment it was to do the killing just went on foot, each with his metal sword and his leather shield. Then they surrounded those who were dancing, going among the cylindrical drums. They struck a drummer's arms. Both of his hands were severed. They struck his neck. His head landed far away. Cortez and the conquistadors were, were successful historians, think, because of technology, European technology, guns, powder, because they brought large animals with them that frightened Indians, and vicious dogs that were not present in the hemisphere before. Uh, also, famously, because of disease, particularly smallpox that wiped out the Aztec Empire. I think we have to think about the extraordinary surprise that was involved here, and that the conquistadors played by different rules. In the case of the Aztecs, who performed almost ceremonial wars in which they took captives alive in order to sacrifice them, they weren't used to an adversary who arrived with the intention of killing one and of, of achieving total victory. After his conquest of the Aztecs, Cortez sent several shiploads of stolen treasure back to Spain, including gold, silver, emeralds, pearls, rare gems, exotic plants and animals, and Indian slaves. This magnificent plunder whetted the appetites of other conquistadors, and they soon followed Cortez's lead. In South America, Pizarro's conquest and looting of the Incan Empire returned unheard of quantities of gold and silver to Spain. But the conquistadors of North America would search in vain for such fabulous riches. Hernando de Soto was one of the most experienced of conquistadors. He'd already been successful in Peru with, with the Pizarros. And yet, like so many conquistadors, there was never a point where he seemed to reach complete saturation. There was another conquest to be made, he thought, in North America. De Soto and Coronado, between them, crossed much of the North American continent. Their insatiable greed and their unflinching cruelty toward the Native Americans are legendary. But another would-be conquistador had quite a different encounter with Indian peoples. Cabeza de Baca, 
and a number of other Spaniards were taken captive when their expedition shipwrecked along the coast of Texas. They eventually escaped and wandered for years across the region, trying to find their way back to Mexico. We traveled in that region through so many different villages of such diverse tongues that my memory gets confused. Cabeza de Vaca finally runs into a group of Pima Indians in northwest Mexico in what is today Sonora. And the Pima say to him, in effect, how can uh, you be one of those Spaniards that you're trying to rejoin? Uh, they kill people. You've cured people. They rob people. You've generously given to us. You're naked. They come with armor and swords. So Cabeza de Vaca very much had entered an Indian world and, and had come to appreciate it. And I think it's the, the rarity of that experience that he had that, that so fascinates us yet today. Cabeza de Vaca was more or less alone in his respect for the Indians. As more and more Spanish settlers came to colonize the New World, they found the Indians themselves to be its most valuable resource. With their labor, the riches of New Spain were extracted and cultivated. But even the Indians turned out to be a limited resource as disease, hunger, and exhaustion quickly depopulated a world once inhabited by perhaps as many as 100 million Native Americans. Gunpowder frightens the most valiant and courageous Indian and renders him slave to the white man's command. Despite the fact that they were greatly outnumbered by the Native Americans, Spanish colonists quickly subdued and settled many areas of the New World. By the late 1500s, almost a quarter of a million Spaniards had come to settle in the colonies of New Spain. The hardships of living in the New World were great, but the rewards could be spectacular. Although precious metals and gems were the most alluring products of the colonies, agriculture and ranching provided more stable profits. Animal hides and sugar grown for export to Spain generated a flourishing colonial economy fueled by Indian slave labor. And when the Indian labor gave out, the Spaniards began to import slave labor from Africa adding yet another lucrative industry in the transatlantic slave trade. While the Spanish colonists were busy extracting the material wealth of the New World and exporting it back to Europe, Spain was exporting a product of its own, Catholicism. Spain's missionaries in the southwest and the southeast, from Florida all the way to California, were Franciscans. They belonged to a religious order that had as its own mission to convert Indians to Catholicism, which also meant, in effect, erasing Indians' previous uh, religions. But I think along with that, historians have been very aware that missionaries served a purpose for the Spanish crown. And the Spanish crown was aware of this purpose, too, in supporting missionaries, namely that Indians would be converted into Spaniards in the process of being converted into Christians. They would learn to dress like Spaniards, farm like Spaniards, ranch like Spaniards. It was one thing for the Spanish to destroy the, the great temples to the Indian gods and to remove the priest class that had existed amongst the Indians. But quite another thing to remove the religious beliefs from the minds and hearts of people. And although Catholicism was introduced, missionaries came, and the peoples of Mexico were converted, many of the old ways and old beliefs, the ways of thinking about things and of seeing things, continued on in a new form as part of an adaptive culture uh, in which the ancient ways were adapted to the new religion and to the new demands of Spanish culture. When other European countries saw the wealth that Spain was importing from its colonies, they too began to look for opportunities in the Americas. To protect its territory from pirates and privateers, Spain established the colony of St. Augustine on the east coast of Florida. Meanwhile, the territory that lay to the north of Mexico and the Caribbean remained largely a mystery. In spite of the failures of De Soto and Coronado to discover hidden riches, many still believed that they were there. And the beguiling myth of the Northwest Passage 
a waterway which allegedly connected the Atlantic to the Pacific, continued to exert its power of the Spanish imagination. It was with these two chimeras in mind that a wealthy silver magnate from Zacatecas named Juan de Oñante set out to colonize New Mexico in 1595. I think one reason the Spanish arrived or moved toward what is now northern New Mexico is that they were very smart people. They went where the food and the supplies were. <laughs> and the Pueblo people had lived for several centuries in that area. Their villages and permanent towns and communities dotted the Rio Grande valleys. They were close to the water. They were close to the forest. They were close to river routes that allowed the movement of goods and of supplies. So I think that the Pueblo people who were divided into, you know, over 20 independent villages had developed a lifestyle that the Spanish found useful to them. But less than a year after Oñante and his band of colonizers arrived, the Pueblo Indians had begun to find their presence intolerable. The Akamans were annoyed, to put it mildly, at Spanish for taking their food, and so killed 11 Spanish soldiers. One of the most controversial episodes in Oñate's tenure as governor of New Mexico was his decision to punish the Akamans who had rebelled. The punishment that they meted out after defeating the Akamans was exceedingly harsh. Oñate ordered the foot to be cut off, or one of the feet to be cut off, of every adult male over age 25. And that has lingered on in the history of New Mexico to the present day. After 10 years of eking out a difficult existence among the Indians, Oñate and his settlers were no richer and no closer to finding the Northwest Passage. In fact, many of the settlers had deserted, preferring to return to Mexico rather than face the hardships of life on the Spanish frontier. In 1608, some of the remaining settlers moved about 20 miles south of their settlement at San Gabriel to a new home they would soon name Santa Fe. Santa Fe was founded um, in this particular location because there wasn't a resident Pueblo population. It was removed from the, um, from the agricultural lands of the Pueblo peoples, and it allowed the Spanish to separate from um, from, from the Pueblo communities and establish their own separate entity and empire uh, here in Santa Fe. The Spaniards may have founded a separate town, but they remained dependent on the Indians for many things, and they were in constant contact with them. As in other parts of the New World, the gradual mixing of races and the blending of cultures would eventually create a new hybrid culture a place where Indian and European traditions met and overlapped. Peoples who live in frontier zones develop cultures that are a little bit of each, where they borrow from, from both and at the same time are just a little bit disloyal to, to each. We have new languages arising along borders, uh, new literatures, new ways of thinking. And to understand America in all, in all of its complexity, I think we do need to understand these frontier regions as much as we understand the, the heartlands. New Mexican culture is very much a blending of the indigenous traditions that were here and um, traditions brought from Spain, traditions brought from Mexico by both people of New World Spanish ancestry, uh, people of Mexican Indian ancestry. So New Mexican culture uh, has very distinct roots from, um, from so many of the traditions of colonial New Mexico, and it's still palpable here in the art traditions, in the architecture, in the food. My favorite symbol for this is uh, the wheat tortilla. The tortilla is a very ancient American Indian bread 
maize bread, it's cornbread. But somehow or other, very, very early in the game, uh, when the, after the Europeans brought in uh, wheat, uh, somebody somewhere started to make uh, wheat tortillas. And now when you go to the grocery store, you have to make a choice. You can get corn or wheat uh, tortillas. They adapted many of the things that the Spaniards brought. They learned to use oxen and plows. And they learned to adopt the chicken and the pig as part of their way of life. And yet, at the same time, they didn't surrender everything that they had had before. At the same time, the Spaniards also had to learn from the, the indigenous peoples. Spaniards who lived on the frontiers of, of uh, Mexico, in what is today New Mexico and Arizona, learned about adobe and learned about uh, how to hunt and uh, how to uh, use the resources of the, of the areas from indigenous peoples. And so, the culture uh, of Spaniards, especially when you got away from the big cities, became also a hybrid culture. The word frontier in, in American history has been one of the most useful and at the same time one of the most controversial terms. In the old sense of the word, the way in which Frederick Jackson Turner led us to think about it, it had this kind of triumphalist edge to it in which white Anglo-American males largely moved west into a so-called virgin land. I think the way we think about the frontier today, frontiers are places where different peoples meet, where two or more cultures come into contact with one another, and the contact may be peaceful, it may be pacific, but we know there are no empty lands out there. There are peoples inhabiting frontier regions. and. It's the dynamics between those peoples that tend to interest us 